Hello, what a great honor it is to join you all today. My name is Ron Sherman, and I want to begin by thanking Professor Bozolensky and Aneta Zimon for inviting me. And I want to thank you all, meeting organizers and attendees, for welcoming me. I must say that I don't really consider myself to be a great healer. I am neither a nurse nor a dermatologist. The greatest success that I've had with wound healing has been the result of teamwork. As in all cases of teamwork, the quality of the work reflects the quality and the capability of the entire team. If I deserve any merit in the field of wound healing, it is simply that I have selected my team wisely. I have managed my team in a way that keeps them happy and healthy, working skillfully and optimally. I call my team the M team. So I call this talk, Medicinal Maggots, the M team. What will their next mission be? By the end of the talk, I think you will have some good ideas about what that next mission could be. That's because by the end of the talk, you should be able to define what is maggot debridement therapy, list at least three appropriate uses or indications for maggot therapy, and list at least three methods for optimizing the safety and efficacy of maggot therapy. Let us begin with an introduction to the maggots family. Maggot is a word we use to specify the larval stage of a fly. There are thousands of species of flies, but only a few are medically useful. Those few are predominantly from the group of flies we call blowflies or Califoridae. In the case of blowflies, the adult female lays eggs and several hours later, tiny larvae will hatch out of those eggs. Those larvae or maggots will secrete their digestive enzymes, feed on the locally dissolving dead tissue and grow over 50 times their volume over the next few days. The mature larvae will then leave the food source and hide in a secluded area in order to pupate and transform into an adult fly. The maggot eggs are barely over one millimeter in length and the newly hatched larvae are only two millimeters long. The larvae will feed and grow over the course of two or three or maybe four days, depending on temperature and the abundance of food until they reach about one centimeter in length. At that point, the larvae will wander off to pupate in seclusion. Myiasis is what we call an infestation of maggots on a live vertebrate host. For example, certain types of blowfly maggots can only digest dead tissue, not live tissue. In nature, these types of maggots normally live on dead animals. But sometimes the adult blowfly will lay her eggs not on a dead animal, but rather on the dead parts of a live animal such as a wound or other infected tissue. Maggot therapy is really just a special therapeutic myiasis. It is the intentional application of live fly larvae to wounds in such a way that optimizes the safety and the wound healing efficacy of these larvae. We optimize safety and efficacy by selecting species that only feed on necrotic tissue not live tissue. When we grow these flies in special uh, laboratories under controlled conditions, we apply pharmaceutical good manufacturing practices to ensure that the fly species are not contaminated. We make the maggots germ-free by washing them with chemical disinfectants. And when the maggots arrive at the bedside, they are applied within special cage-like dressings that prevent the maggots from crawling away until the therapist is ready to remove them all at once and dispose of them as typical infectious wet wound dressing waste. Those are some of the procedures that we use to make maggot therapy a relatively safe treatment. What types of benefits can we expect from medicinal maggots? Well, Blowfly larvae have been found to have three major beneficial actions on wounds, debridement, 
disinfection, and the stimulation of wound healing. I do not have time to explain the mechanism behind these actions, but I will leave you with a reference at the end of this presentation. Okay, so medicinal maggots are effective in wound care, and with a few controls, they were found to be safe enough for the United States Food and Drug Administration to permit the marketing of the brand medical maggots in 2004. So what types of wounds should we treat with these maggots? The indications listed on the labeling in the United States are based on the types of wounds we studied in the 1990s, predominantly patients with pressure ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers, venous stasis ulcers, and post-surgical or traumatic wounds. Now that's a whole lot of uh, different types of wounds, but there are many kinds of wounds that are not listed uh, among those, and some therapists are using them for those other wounds. We did a study published in 2007 that suggested that as many as 24% of patients treated with maggot therapy were being treated for conditions not specifically listed on the labeling. We call that off-label use. These included ischemic wounds and arterial ulcers, burns, debridement of necrotic tumors, debridement of bone and joints, including osteitis and osteomyelitis. Maggots were being used for non-debridement functions as well, such as disinfection, removal of biofilm, and growth stimulation of seemingly clean but non-healing wounds. I have been asked to share some of these cases with you to illustrate the diversity of wounds that can be helped by maggot therapy. Let's begin with a simple case. This 67-year-old paraplegic man who had recurrent pressure injuries over the ischium requiring flap reconstructive surgery. A couple of years later, he returned with another ulcer and requested maggot debridement this time instead of the recommended flap revision. He is seen here, first after two weeks of hospitalization on the surgical service without much improvement in the wound. And then 10 days later, the wound healed after two three-day cycles of maggot therapy. This 61-year-old man with diabetes developed a neuropathic ulcer and was hospitalized for IV antibiotics and twice weekly surgical debridement. He is seen here after three weeks in the hospital, just before starting maggot therapy, and then again three weeks later after receiving twice weekly maggot debridement instead of twice weekly surgical debridement that he had received before. But now look at this patient who was referred for an amputation, but refused. Instead, he was treated with maggot therapy despite significant bone infection. You can see that the wound was cleaned by the maggots and the bones were debrided too. Ultimately, his foot healed and the patient was saved from a below knee amputation. After suffering from a heart attack, this paraplegic man was administered adrenergic drugs through a leg vein, which leaked, causing ischemic necrosis over 30% of his anterior leg. The surgeons were uncomfortable debriding this wound while he was still in the ICU. So soon after his heart attack, so they called in the M team, which dissolved the necrotic tissue. The eschar fell away in two large pieces and the wound down to the periosteum filled in with granulation tissue, after which the wound was covered with a split thickness skin graft. This 44-year-old man suffers from severe limb ischemia due to Berger's disease. He lost his right foot in a motor vehicle accident and has now failed two years of treatment to heal his left foot. Amputation was advised, but he refused. With a trial of maggot therapy, the necrotic tissue was dissolved and granulation tissue formed in its place. The dead bone could not be dissolved by the maggots, but it continued to separate from the viable bone and fell off, leaving the live bone to cover with granulation tissue. Here you see his foot nearly completely healed 
as published by Mirabzadeh and colleagues in 2017. Other types of wounds successfully treated with magotherapy include this three-year-old non-healing foot wound in a man with sclerodactyly. Amputation avoided. This photograph illustrates pyoderma gangrenosum, successfully debrided with magotherapy, as published by Dr. Din and colleagues. This is the photograph of a patient with severe lymphedema to the point that he developed non-filarial elephantiasis. His doctor wrote that patient refused amputation, so we could offer him only palliative care. What was this palliative care? It was maggot therapy. But after maggot therapy, the leg cleared up substantially. So they did a couple surgical excisions after that, and the patient walked out of the hospital on his own feet without any more pain, odor, or embarrassment. The same thing could be said for this woman with a fungating breast cancer who spent over a year at home in seclusion because of the wound's stench and drainage. Surgery was not an option for her, so she requested maggot therapy. Less than 24 hours later, the maggots had already dissolved away the necrotic tissue down to viable tissue. The odor and drainage were now gone, and the pain was much decreased. This patient was now able to go out of her home. She was able to comfortably visit with friends and family members until she passed away a couple months later. This is truly palliative care. What about putting maggots near holes? Don't they go into holes? Yes, maggots love to go into holes and tunnels, but they don't stay there. They come out if there is no food or when they are satiated and it's time to leave the host to pupate. Here is a case of maggot therapy used to treat a necrotic glands penis, which failed to respond to repeated surgical debridement. Medicinal maggots were applied to the necrotic glands and covered with a net dressing. The maggots did their job, dissolving away the necrotic tissue without complication, despite the hole and connecting body cavity. Speaking of body cavities, in 2007, we published two cases of maggot therapy successfully used inside the abdomen and the chest. One was a young woman with a non-functioning bowel who required an ileorectal bypass. Unfortunately, the anastomosis leaked and she developed necrotizing peritonitis. Systemic antibiotics and surgical debridement in the OR every other day failed to halt the infection. So 3,000 larvae were placed in the open abdomen in the OR under anesthesia. The maggots were removed 48 hours later. The patient healed completely after that without any further complication and without further need for surgical resection or maggot debris mark. The second case is that of a 53-year-old smoker who developed bronchogenic carcinoma of the right upper lobe. After pneumonectomy, chemotherapy, and radiation, he developed an empyema, infection in pus, in the right chest. Multiple surgical procedures were performed without resolution of the problem. In 2004, medicinal maggots were introduced through his thoracotomy in hopes that they would dissolve the remaining necrotic tissue and eradicate the infection. The dressings were removed two days later, but very few live maggots were seen exiting the hole. So the next day, a search party was sent in, that is, a second batch of maggots. Those maggots exited the thoracotomy two days later, plump and satiated, Sure enough, endoscopic visualization through the thoracotomy revealed that all of the fibrotic plaque and necrotic fascia had now disappeared. Negative pressure was applied to the opening, which completely closed within six weeks. Some people might say that I am merely an animal trainer, but I am not even that. I did not teach the maggots what to do or how to do it. They taught me, they showed me what they could do. All I did was watch and listen to my team, to my maggots, and I read 
from the masters and researchers who came before me, and I listened to my patients who were willing to do anything to save their limbs. By using maggots, I proved to my patients that I too was willing to do anything to save their limbs. And by giving my patients a trial of maggot therapy, my team and I were usually successful in achieving our mission. I have come to the end of my talk. I need to thank many people who made this work possible, but I have time enough only to thank those who made the greatest sacrifice over the past 30 years. And that would be the S team, my wife and our two daughters. Here is a website where you can learn more about maggot therapy. My colleagues and I recently published an entire book edited by Frank Stadler which you can read or download for free from this website. Thank you again for letting me share our work with you.